Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For those who aren't aware of the uh, Muslim tradition, the greeting that we often uh, that we offer when we meet one another is Salam Alaikum, which basically translates as uh, "May the peace, mercy, and blessings of God be upon you." It's just like how we say hi in English or "What's up." So it's just our way of of greeting one another. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Abi Al Qasim Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Wa ala ali bayti tayyibin atahirin la siyama maulana wa sayyidi sahib al-asri wa zaman ruhi wa arwahu al-alamin lahu al-fida wa ajal allahu ta'ala farajuhu al-sharif wa lanatu da'imatu wa la ada'ihim wa munkari fadha'ilihim al-alan ila qiyami yawmi deen amma bad rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu kawli First off, uh, congratulations to all of the Followers of the Ahlul Bayt who are here tonight, this evening, as we celebrate this, um, as it sees as the greatest celebration in Islam. And for our guests from outside of our community, also wanted to welcome you to be here today um, as we celebrate what is deemed as the greatest celebration, the greatest event within the Islamic calendar for the Muslim community on a whole. Um, because we have a diverse group of people, I'm going to try to water down my talk so it makes it a bit understandable for all of you. Um, but also try to convey a message to the participants from within our own local community. Um, so as Muslims, obviously, we know that we have many days of celebration within our community. As a faith tradition, we have many different events that we celebrate, where we commemorate, where we gather together in festivity, in, in fun. And officially within the Muslim calendar, we have a few days that are sort of singled out as being greater than other days. And when the sixth Imam, the, the, the sixth successor of the Prophet Muhammad, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. When the sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, was asked by a companion, by an individual, one of his followers, that do the believers, do the believers have a day of celebration other than the two Eid, the day of Eid al-Adha and the day of Eid al-Fitr and Jummah? So as we know, Eid al-Adha, which we translate into English as the Feast of the Sacrifice, uh, we commemorated that as a Muslim community globally last Friday, where we marked the sacrifice that Prophet Abraham was ready to give to God in devotion to God. And Eid al-Fitr, as we know, is the feast or the celebration after the month of Ramadan, so after 30 days of fasting, Muslims uh, conclude that period of fasting with the Eid al-Fitr, where we uh, are again permitted to eat, engage in all of those actions which were unlawful in the month of Ramadan within the daytime period. And obviously Friday is a day of congregation. Obviously in Canada, we have Saturday, Sundays off. Within the Muslim tradition, Friday is the day of rest, uh, the day of praying, the day of uh, a bit more extra devotion to God, just as our Christian brethren go to church on Sundays, the Jewish community, their Sabbath would begin on the Friday evening until Saturday evening. As Muslims, we have Friday as our day of celebration. So the sixth Imam is asked, other than these days, the days of Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, and Friday, are there any other great, magnificent days of celebration? And that is where the sixth Imam came along and he says that yes, they have a day, which is greater than these days. So although to conclude the month of Ramadan is a great event, for those who have returned from the Hajj, and I see there's a few people who have returned from the Hajj, may Allah accept your Hajj, and may Allah give you the ability to perform the Hajj once again. For them to complete the Hajj, and for Muslims on a whole, Eid al-Adha completes that Hajj. But the sixth Imam says that there is a day even greater than all of these, and that is when the commander of the faithful, the brother and the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad was established as the divinely appointed successor of the Prophet. And this is that day when the Messenger of Allah, where the Messenger of God laid the pledge of friendship, of wilayat, of authority upon all men and women on the necks of every single believing man and woman on the event of Ghadir. So this is a very tremendous, very important day within the Islamic calendar. It forms not only the basis of leadership within Islam, that the Prophet of Islam did not leave this world without appointing a successor. And obviously this appointment came from God, we believe, to the Prophet Muhammad. 
but that this religion was made complete and perfected. And I'll share with us just one verse of the Quran in terms of this discussion. But two words just to understand. We have the word, the word complete. And I'll, I'll give you the context, the, the verse of the Quran, just once we understand these two words. The word complete is, what one, is one of the words that God uses in the Quran to describe a point in the history of Islam. And when you look in the dictionary, complete means to make, finish making or doing something. Make something whole or perfect. When something is done, you've done everything that you need to do. When you're building, let's say, a home, or you're baking a batch of cookies, whatever you're doing, once you've finished the entire task, it's now complete. Keep this in mind as I go to the verse of the Quran, please. I'm not just giving these words for you know, no reason. There's a reason behind it. And then the word perfect comes out. And perfect means to make something completely free from fault or defect as much as possible. So you have completion of something and you have something being perfected. And they're two unique words in English and also in the Arabic construct. Because, you know, as an example, maybe you want to build a home. And so you'll hire an engineer, you'll hire an architect to come and draw up the blueprints for your home, what you want it to look like. You'll go through all these city channels, get the, get the, getting the, you know, the approvals for the construction. They'll review the blueprints, make sure everything looks okay. And then once everything is ready, you'll hire a company. They'll come in. They'll build this home for you. And then you'll eventually move into that house. But, you know, it goes step by step. You have to get all the permits in place. You'd lay the foundation. You'd build the walls. All of that would complete the building of the house. Once the walls are in place, the roof is there, maybe the wiring, the electrical, the plumbing is done, the building is complete. But you still can't move into that house. It's not perfect. Right? You don't have paint on the walls. Carpeting might not be there. Your furniture would not be there. You wouldn't have all the light fixtures. So your house was completed at one stage, but it still wasn't perfect. It still had a lot of work to do. If we understand that, then what happens in Islam is that, and I'll speed up the whole history of Islam because it begins at the time of Prophet Adam thousands of years ago and culminates with the becoming of Prophet Muhammad and his chain of successorship. But the Prophet of Islam, he brings a religion called what we call Islam today. But Islam really in English, it translates as submission to God. So as Muslims, we believe that what Adam brought, being him and Eve being the first people on earth, Adam was a Muslim. He was bringing Islam because he was submitting to God's way. When Noah was uh, you know, inundated with the flood and that, that water which wiped out most of the earth, the religion of Noah was not Noahism. It wasn't to follow him. It was Islam. It was submit to God according to their time. And the same goes for Moses, for Abraham, for Jesus. All of them did not bring religions to be named after them. They brought Islam, which was submission to God. And so this, year, this, this chain of thousands of years of prophets, 124,000 prophets, as Muslims we believe, came to humanity. We believe that with the coming of Prophet Muhammad and the, um, the appointment of the successor, that this chain was completed, Islam was now a completed religion, and that now the final touches just had to be put onto the religion. So prophethood brought the entire teachings to humanity, it brought the conduct, the moral, ethical teachings, the method of how to submit to God, and then the stage of the prophet announcing the successorship, it, it, it brings that beauty to the religion in that it makes it a religion which would continue on until the end of time. And so before the verse of the Quran comes down to the Prophet Muhammad to complete the religion, an event takes place on a day like today, over 1400 years ago, that the Prophet Muhammad had finished his Hajj, his pilgrimage to Mecca, and incidentally, for those who are not aware, he only performed one pilgrimage in his lifetime, and there was reasons because of why he was only allowed to do one pilgrimage, but he performed that one pilgrimage. He was leaving home from Mecca, to go back to Medina, which is about 300 kilometers north of Mecca. And on that journey home, he got to a point, a geographic point, between the two cities of Mecca and Medina, where the pilgrims would basically split and go into their own respective countries. 
So pilgrims who had come from the east, from Iraq, from Persia, at that area would be a crossroad, they would go east. Pilgrims who are attending the Hajj uh, with the Prophet who are coming from Syria, from, from the Levant, they would leave that and go northwest. And so this was a, a point where all the pilgrims would separate. At that point comes a revelation from God to the Prophet through the angel Gabriel, where God tells the Prophet Muhammad, he says, O Messenger, convey that which has come to you from your Lord. And if you do not do so, it is as if you have not conveyed any of the message. So God is telling the Prophet that your 23 years of prophetic mission, your 23 years of struggle will be all in vain, null and void, if you do not convey one specific message to the Muslim community. Now this was not a new message per se, this was something which the Prophet had conveyed to the Muslims over that period of 23 years that he had been given the official prophethood. But this was sort of the final touches. He would, he would pass away only two months after this event. And so he wanted to make sure that the Muslim community were aware of what the final message was for them. He gave a lengthy sermon. It tops over three hours. Don't worry, I'm not going to relate it today because I know the food is, the aroma is coming for the food and I'm sure people are focused on that. So I'm not going to go through what the Prophet said in three hours, but I will just give you one sentence of what the Messenger of God said. He, then he said a lot of different things. He talked about, for, just as an example, he talked about the fact that discrimination has no place in religion. He actually singled out and he said that there is no greatness of a white over a black, or a black over a white, or a red over a yellow. Nobody has any preference. Right? And this is an issue we see in our world today, discrimination. We don't see it maybe as often in Canada, but we know that there are many white supremacist hate groups that are festering in Canada, including in Alberta, and I'm sure our law enforcement officials are doing their due diligence to keep us all safe from these threats. But we see that around the world, discrimination is rampant in many countries. The Prophet made it a, a point in his last sermon to ensure that the Muslim community, first off, was aware that discrimination has no place in Islam. He, he, the Prophet said that the only time that you are better than somebody else is in your proximity to God, how close you are spiritually. And really nobody here can judge who is closer to God. Nobody knows. This is not a badge or an ID card that somebody has in their wallet or their purse. Nobody knows who is closer to God, so we should treat all people as equals in humanity. He also made note of the point that women when they come into a marriage are a trust given to that man by God and that the man has to honor and respect his wife. And again, we see in our society today many cases of abuse within the home of women having to go to women's shelters and take their children with them because they're facing domestic abuse. And again, the prophet was very clear to single this out 1400 years ago. It's as if he knew that in the future these would be the problems of society. And last but not least, I'll mention the one third point he talked about was interest, usury. And he says that from this day forward, I am making a clearer pact with all of you that all usury must, must be forbidden. Again, we look at the world today and you see how many people are in debt. Just the other day, I was listening to CBC News and I think they said the average Canadian, other than home house mortgage, they're like $40,000 in debt credit cards and lines of credit and all of these. And you know what happens when you have debt, you have your interest charges and you can't even pay just the minimal credit card payments many times because of so many other factors. And so the prophet said he eliminated all interest, all usury from that day forward because he knew that debt and going into debt and having to pay loan sharks and interest, it can kill a person. And you know how many people commit suicide because they just can't take care of their expenses. So he mentioned these three and many other points. But then the Prophet said that he wanted to ensure our guidance until the end of this world. And he said a very beautiful statement. He says, I'm leaving behind for all of you, the Muslims, two weighty things, two important things to hold on to. That if you hold on to both of them, if you follow both of them as a Muslim community, that you would never go astray. You would never leave the path of true guidance. And he says, I leave behind me the book of God, the Quran, and my family, my Ahlul Bayt, as he called them in the Arabic. 
And these were certain specific individuals from within his family that he expected the entire Muslim community to refer to for all religious rulings. And obviously when we look at the world today, and we can't sugarcoat this because when we look at even the Muslim community, we see that there are many people, very few, but they obviously are a number, they're a, they're a vocal number, who obviously commit actions against the name of Islam, against the name of the Quran. Things that the Prophet was clear were forbidden, Muslims unfortunately some have taken to be a part of their lifestyle. And one of the key reasons obviously, I don't want to analyze all of them, but it is because of the fact that when people tend to drift away from their principles, people of any religion, Islam, of Christianity, of Judaism, of whatever ism we follow, when we drift away from the principles of our religion, of what we believe to be sacred from the divine, when we begin to just you know, think about the self, and we become materialistic and egotistical, then power, money, all of these things become the forefront of our lives. And that obviously re results in the downfall of the individual, of the family. Once the family is destroyed, you know, the social structure of our society it is on da dangerous, shaky ground. And ultimately, obviously, we see what can happen when world wars occur and people kill one another because of you know, just complete ignorance and unawareness of one another. So after this entire sermon that the Prophet gives, he then is given another verse of the Qur'an. So as we know as Muslims that whenever things would happen in the life of the Prophet and the community, God would respond by sending down verses of the Qur'an to explain the situation to the Muslims and to those around the Prophet as well. And this is no, uh, no you know, exception to the rule. So the Prophet designates the Qur'an and his family as being those two guides that we all must follow for salvation of this world and the next. And then God reveals this verse of the Qur'an where he says, This day I have completed your religion for you and perfected my favors upon you and chosen for you Islam as your religion. So perfection and completion, Islam was always there from the time of Adam, but it was not yet perfected. It was not yet a full-fledged system that people could follow. And so when the event of Ghadir takes place on this same day, over 1400 years ago in the history of Islam, we believe that as God says that this is the moment where he completes the religion of Islam. It's now a perfected religion. There is no blemish in it. There's no mistakes in it. And that this is the way of life. Again, Islam being submission to the will of God, complete and unquestionable submission to the will of God. I have a few minutes left, so I'll conclude with one or two last points that, you know, people sometimes wonder, especially from within the non-Shia community, from within Muslims on a whole, but from those who do not follow this particular ideology, that where does this event come from? Right? Is it just an event that a few scholars have spoken about? And I just wanted to share one inter inter interesting piece of information from a book called Al-Ghadir. Al-Ghadir is literally a 20 volume encyclopedia about this event that we are celebrating today. 20 volumes a scholar wrote, each volume is around 600 pages. And just to give you some information on how the scholar wrote this book, the scholar's name is the late uh, Sheikh Abdul Hussein Amini Al-Najafi. He was born in Azerbaijan, near the Iran-Azerbaijan um, border, and he, he passed away very recently. He passed away in 1970, actually. So only about 40 years ago, he passed away. Or just about 50 years ago. He lived for 70 years, and he spent 40 years of his life writing this book. Not just, I mean, he didn't have Google back then to, you know, Google a book and, a, and, and an article. So literally for 40 years, he traveled from Iran. He went to India. He went to Pakistan. He went to Turkey. He went to Syria, he went all the way to Morocco, to Egypt. He traveled to 10 or 15 countries. He, he writes this in his memoirs. And he read, he says in his memoirs, he read a minimal of 10,000 books cover to cover, and he referenced over 100,000 books in compiling this encyclopedia. So 40 years of his life he spent, so he lived until 70, he writes this 20 volumes, and even then, when he passed away, he still was not able to complete the entire work. 
So even after his death, there are volumes that still remain to this day unpublished, that scholars do not have access to. So 40 years he spends writing 20 volumes, traveling to 10 or so countries, 10,000 books, 100,000, uh, 10,000 books he reads cover to cover, 100,000 that he references. And when he gets to the point of where this event of Ghadir takes place and where is the proof of it, because it happened 1,400 years ago, right? There was no YouTube. You couldn't Snapchat the event. You couldn't tweet it live as it was happening. So he had to go and find what is the chain of authority? Who talked about this event over the last 1,400 years? What scholar heard it from what scholar, from what scholar, and trace it all the way back to the time of the Prophet. And he gives a list of 110 companions of the Prophet who, have, who were directly there to hear the words of the Messenger of God. Not only that, he then says that there are 84 people who came after those 110, and this is just the minimal number, who narrate this event of Ghadir. And he says from the scholars of the Sunni community, the non-Shias, from the 8th century up until the 20th century, so our era, he quotes over 360 scholars who have narrated this event of Ghadir and have, you know, have documented it within their books of traditions. So he goes to prove, and I mean, obviously it's 20 volumes, you can read it on your own if you have a couple years to spare or free. You can read the book and see all the evidence that he brings. I'll just give you one chart and I'll conclude with this. And this is from the main books of the Ahlul Sunnah of the Sunni community because obviously within our books of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, this hadith is available. But I did some research into the six major books of traditions. And there are two different formulas that the Muslim community quotes. Some Muslims say the Prophet said, I leave behind me the Quran, the book of God, and my tradition, my way of life. And others say, no, he said, I leave the Quran, the book of God, and my family to follow. So on the six most authoritative books of the Sunni community, first of all, none of the six talk about the Quran and the Sunnah as being any form of guidance. They all talk about the family of the Prophet. And so this shows us one rallying point of the Muslim community, that despite our differences of you know, how we pray, minor differences we may have in jurisprudence and theology, that on the level of guidance after the death of the Prophet, all Muslims are obligated, as the Prophet has said, to follow his family members. And out of the six major canonical books of traditions of the statements of the Prophet Muhammad, three of them clearly mention this hadith. And I've given you the references in English and in Arabic that are there. You can research that if you'd like. Three of the major books don't make any reference to this event at all, and three sp speak about it in the details that I have just presented, and more or less they talk about it in, the, in a similar fashion. So just to conclude that this shows us that there can be unity within our diversity, just as it was mentioned by the MC in the beginning that even though in Canada we have a wide, you know, we, we're, we're of many different colors, many different languages, many different religions, and we all can, you know, coexist peacefully with harmony and unity together. Also, I would conclude as saying that within the Muslim community, although we have ideological differences, we don't all see eye to eye in certain issues within Islam. But when it comes to leadership after the demise of the Prophet, this event of Ghadir is cemented within all of our books of traditions. It's in the Quran. All of the major scholars of the Ahl Sunnah have narrated this event. And that if we can, as a community, and I speak to the Muslim community, that if we can unite with our Christian, with, our, with the Sikhs, with the Hindus, with the Buddhists, with the atheists, if we can unite and cooperate with one another, then we obviously should be able to unite and cooperate with one another within the Muslim tradition. I close and we ask God to accept this act of worship from us this evening. We ask God to bestow all of his blessings upon all of us and that we are able to understand the importance of this event within our lives and that we are able to really you know, enjoy the blessings that God has given to us on this event of Ghadir. We ask God, we ask Allah to forgive us any of our sins. We ask him to keep us all on the straight path. And we ask our creator to hasten in the return of our 12th Imam, Imam al-Mahdi, and that together with Prophet Jesus, that they can both return to bring about a government of justice, of equality, of humanity upon this earth, especially at a time when human beings have lost a lot of the humanity. 
Let us close by remembering all of the deceased from our communities, those who have passed away, those who have left us from our family, our friends, the scholars, those who have given their lives for the preservation of this religion with a Surah Al-Fatiha, but before that, one salawat upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad.